In this episode, I don't have a script really, I just have my notes, and I have about nine hours before this episode is supposed to go online, so I don't have any time for editing. So this could be a, a really strange episode. Welcome to the NC Everything Podcast. I'm your host, Curtis, and this is the bi-weekly show where I talk about everything that has anything to do with North Carolina. Now, before I get into all the reasons why I'm behind and all the other stuff, check the description below and right at the top of the description, it'll tell you when the actual content starts. That way you can skip all the talking. Now, as far as why I'm so far behind and I'm so rushed, I got a promotion at work and now I'm in charge of a lot of people. It keeps me really busy, and when you add that with all the kids' stuff and, and yard stuff and the welding shop behind me, I, I just I lost track of time, and I had other stuff I needed to do, and I just didn't have time to put a script together and, and relax and record. I'm not going to rush through this episode, but uh, what you're going to get is certainly raw audio and raw video. Now, if you're uh, a returning listener to the podcast, thank you for coming back. And if this is your first time listening to the, the NC Everything podcast, I would definitely suggest going back and listening to some of my other episodes where I was a lot more prepared to record. And before we get into the actual content, I got to go through the promotional stuff. If you like the podcast, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. You can join the Facebook group. And if you're listening and you'd rather watch, you can watch me on YouTube. And if you're watching and you'd rather listen, I can be found on most podcast players, and you can find links to the Facebook group, the YouTube channel, and a contact button down in the description below. And I think that's about enough of that, so let's go ahead and get into the content. Today we're going to talk about Eric Rudolph, and this came in from Jack from Transylvania County. Thank you, Jack, for the suggestion. So if you know anything at all about Eric Rudolph, you know there's two main characters. There's Eric Rudolph and there's Richard Jewell. So I may be bouncing back and forth between them, or I, I may cover one and then the other. But for right now, we're going to jump on Eric Rudolph. Eric Rudolph was born on September 16th, 1966 in Merritt Island, Florida. At age 15 in 1981, his daddy dies and he moves to Macon County, North Carolina. From here, Rudolph joins the Nanahala School, but he drops out after the ninth grade and starts working for his brother Daniel. When he was 18, him and his mother joined the Church of Israel, which is a Christian identity church. I don't know anything at all about the Christian identity church, but I read that one of their philosophies is that Jesus Christ cannot return to earth until the earth has been cleansed, until the earth has been cleansed of all the devil's influences. That really doesn't sound that bad. It's Seems kind of docile, except that the Christian Identity Church also believed that the Jewish people were children of Satan and they had to go. The Christian Identity Compound that the Rudolph family became members of was led by a guy named Nord Davis Jr. One thing about Nord, he's kind of like Charles Manson. He had some really terrible ideas and he was too much of a coward to do it himself. So he was looking for one special person to kind of take care of his dirty work. And Eric Rudolph, he, he didn't mind at all being that one special person. Now, the Church of Christian Identity really had nothing to do with the 1996 Olympic bombing that I'm going to talk about, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what kind of person Eric Rudolph was. Eric and his mama, they joined the church and would follow it for about seven years. During this time, he was just soaking up all that propaganda. Also, during this time, he would join the military and he got his basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. In 1989, he was discharged from the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, Kentucky for smoking weed. Now we're going to talk about the Olympics for a minute and kind of how they came to Atlanta, Georgia. I don't personally follow, I don't personally follow the Olympics, so I had to really research how the Olympics work and how they choose which city. So during the, during the 70s, an Olympic handball player named Dennis 
Burkhiltz, he started campaigning to have the 1984 Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia. The problem is, the Olympics had a, a really bad reputation. The 1968 Olympics, the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico City, and the 1972 Olympic Games in Munich resulted in massacres. The 1976 Olympic Games in Montreal, Canada, left the city with a really huge bill to pay. And so the Atlanta leaders decided to play it safe and forego bidding for the Olympics to be held in their city. Instead, the 1984 Olympic Games were held in Los Angeles. But the idea of having the Olympic Games in Atlanta, the idea of having the Olympic Games in Atlanta came back around in 1987 through a guy named Billy Payne. He thought the Olympics would, would be really good for Atlanta, Georgia. And so he got up with Mayor Andrew Young and pitched the idea. The mayor loved the idea of having the Olympics in Atlanta. And so one thing led to another, and they formed a group called the Atlanta Nine. The whole job of the Atlanta Nine was to handle the logistics of the Olympics. They took care of all the red tape, the politics, the planning, and of course, the Olympic bid. The Olympic bid is more or less just declaring that you want to be a candidate for the Olympics. And then ultimately a vote is held and your city could be chosen. On the ballot for the 1996 Olympics was Atlanta, Georgia, Athens, Greece, Belgrade, Yugoslavia, Manchester, England, Melbourne, Australia, and Toronto, Canada. The vote was held in 1990, and of course, Atlanta won. Opening ceremonies would be held on July 19, 1996. So now let's talk about Richard Jewell. Richard Jewell was one of those guys who always wanted to be a cop, but for the most part, he was always a security guard. Now, I'm not picking on security guards or potential police officers, but I have a lot of, but a lot of police officers, you know, start out as security guards and some of them never really make it to police. Richard Jewell would bounce from job to job as security guard, but his big hang up was he was, he was really strange. And he was also really overzealous for police work. At one of his jobs as a campus security, He'd stop people for broken taillights and other minor violations like that. It got bad enough that people started to complain. In 1996, he finally makes it as a sheriff's deputy, but he resigned from that job as opposed to being fired due to his tendency to, to wreck the patrol cars. In June of 1996, AT&T was building a stage in Centennial Park in Atlanta, Georgia, in preparation for the Olympics. Now, around that same time, Richard Jewell gets a job with a security firm that's ultimately hired by AT&T to provide security around that stage during the Olympic Games. Ironically, Richard Jewell joked to a co-worker that if something happened at the Olympic Games, he wanted to be right in the middle of it. At that time, there's really no way he could have known that something would happen and he would indeed be right in the middle of it. Now, let's get back to Eric Rudolph for just a minute. Two months before the Olympic Games, he tells his family that he's moving to Colorado. However, he, he never went to Colorado. Not yet, anyway. He, uh, he goes to Colorado later on in this story. Now, him telling his family he was going to Colorado, I don't know if that was some sort of confusing tactic or if he really was going to go and just changed his mind. But at some point, he did make the decision that he was going to plant five individual bombs around the Olympic Games. Again, this had nothing to do with the church. His whole goal was just to stop the Olympic Games. And I, I really have no idea why he wanted to do that. His plan was to detonate the five bombs individually, but call 911 before each bombing. And again, I don't know why he wanted to call the police first, unless it was one of those tactics where you get a lot of emergency personnel together for a higher body count. Anyway, the Olympics would be held from July 19th to August 4th, 1996. Now let's go to the night of July 27th. It's close to midnight. There's about 15,000 people in Centennial Park that night. Mixed in the crowd was 29-year-old Eric Rudolph. He was walking around the park with a huge backpack strapped to his back. Inside the backpack were three pipe bombs and several Tupperware several Tupperware containers full of nails. Over at the AT&T stage, a band called Jack Mack and the Heart Attack were performing. Near, the near that stage, there was a five-story sound tower. Near that tower, there were three benches, and Eric Rudolph, he makes his way over to the benches, 
and he shoves his backpack underneath one of them. He sets the timer for, he reaches in the bag and sets the timer on the bomb for 55 minutes, and then he abandons the backpack. Around midnight, the band decides to take a break, and some people are left over in front of the stage, and they're getting kind of rowdy. They're drinking and having fun. Where Richard Jewell, ever the attentive, Richard Jewell, ever the attentive security guard, heads over to them and tries to get them to calm down. And they're not really listening, so he calls over a guy from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation named Tom Davis. And since Tom Davis was actual law enforcement, he figured Tom could kind of help, you know, get them guys to calm down. This is when they noticed the abandoned backpack under the bench. So they start asking the crowd if this backpack was theirs, and nobody claims it. Tom Davis, the GBI agent, he follows protocol and reports a suspicious package. Then he starts setting out a 15-foot perimeter around the backpack until the bomb squad can get out there and take a look at it. Meanwhile, Richard Jewell gets on the radio, and he lets his superiors know kind of what's going on. This was around 12.57 uh, a.m. at the time. At 12.57, Eric Rudolph calls 911, and he tells them there's a bomb in Centennial Park, and it'll go off in 30 minutes. I don't know if he intentionally lied or he just was wrong, was wrong about the time. He told them 30 minutes, but there was only 22 minutes left on the timer. Over at the sound stage or the sound tower, Richard Jewell, he heads inside and starts going floor to floor. He's letting everybody know that there's a suspicious package outside. And he tells them that if I come back in here and tell you to get out, you get out right away. There were 11 people in the tower at that time. While Richard Jewell was in the tower, his supervisor had showed up outside and he was looking at the suspicious package. Also on scene was Bob Ehring, who was an assistant chief of police from Blue, Blue Springs, Missouri. About that time, about the time Richard comes out of the tower, they start looking inside the backpack. That's when they realize that it's not just an abandoned backpack, uh, there's explosives in there. Law enforcement starts moving everybody even farther back from the package. Meanwhile, Richard Jewell, he heads back inside to start telling everybody to get out. When Richard Jewell comes back out of the tower, there are still people sitting on the benches. I don't know if these people that were still sitting around, if they just weren't taking it seriously or they weren't moving fast enough, but they were in, in some danger. The police officers, I guess because people weren't moving quite fast enough, the police officers, they kind of line up to create a, a human wall between the bomb and the crowd. And that's when the bomb detonated. Shrapnel went everywhere and tore into the back of the police officers who were standing guard. 44-year-old Alice Hawthorne was killed instantly by the shrapnel. Overall, 111 people were injured. By midday on Saturday, everybody was asking a ton of questions, like, what happened? Why did it happen? Who did it? How did they do it? Do we stop the Olympics, or do we continue? A press conference is held that Saturday, or that Saturday morning, and they had pointed out in that press conference that it was a security guard who had found the bomb. CNN would be one of the first ones, or they would be the first ones to interview Richard Jewell about the incident. Richard Jewell was about to step into the spotlight and stay there for a really long time. Unfortunately, one of Richard Jewell's former employees, Ray Clear, he'd saw the CNN interview and he had his concerns. Richard Clear, I might have said he was one of Richard Jewell's um, former employees, Ray Clear, not Rich, I'm getting confused here. Ray Clear was the president of Piedmont College, and he was the former boss of Richard Jewell. Anyway, he, he kind of knew how strange Richard was, and, and so he calls the FBI, and he tells them that he's kind of an odd fellow, and he mentioned that he, or he kind of hinted at him, possibly that Richard may have been involved in the bombing. You know, Richard Jewell sets the bomb he lets it go off, and he's going to rush in and be the hero. Now, keep in mind, at, at this time, they still had no idea who had planted the bomb. Also, Eric Rudolph had given up on the idea of setting off four more bombs. So it was one bomb, and it got quiet. So they, they didn't have any way of piecing together any motive, and Eric Rudolph wasn't coming out and, and declaring that he's the one responsible. So they had really nothing to go on at this time. And it doesn't get any better for Richard Jewell. 
the FBI started looking into him, and they found out that not only did he have a green backpack, very similar to the one that they found in the park, but he also had books on how to make bombs. By July 29th, 2000, by July 29th, 1996, Richard Jewell was the prime suspect for the Olympic bombings. For the next six months, Richard Jewell was interviewed by the press and the police. Of course, the story leaked that they may have planted the bomb. The story leaked that he may have planted the bomb. So even though the investigation eventually went away from Richard Jewell, you know, he, he was judged by a jury of his peers. Ten years later, in 2006, Richard Jewell was officially honored by Governor Sonny Perdue for his heroism on the night of 1996. A little over a year after that, Richard Jewell would die at the age of 44 from complications with diabetes. Now, weird or not, I'm glad Richard Jewell didn't go to his grave with the world thinking that he had bombed the 1996 Olympics. Now, let's get back to 1996 and Eric Rudolph. Six months after the Olympic bombing, three more bombs occurred. The first one was in January of 1997 at an abortion clinic. The next was February of 1997 at a gay nightclub. And the third was in January of 1998 at a women's health clinic. And it was actually these three bombings that linked Eric Rudolph to the, to the Olympic bombing. You see, they compared you know, bomb parts and bomb, bomb fragments, and they could kind of see the similarities. Also, Eric was seen fleeing the scene of one of the bombings, one of the, the later three bombings. He officially becomes a suspect in 1998, and once he realizes he's a suspect, he, he, heads, into the North Carolina, he heads into the North Carolina mountains to hide out. And I remember this really well. I was 13 in 1996, and I remember for years it seemed like everybody was asking for updates on Eric Rudolph and they were hunting for Eric Rudolph, and where is Eric Rudolph? So I, I remember really well all the news coverage about him hiding out. And it was, you know, we're nowhere near his hiding area, the Nantahala Forest. Where we're at, we're nowhere near it. But I, I used to hunt a lot. I used to fish. And I remember uh, being out in the woods around here just thinking about Eric Rudolph hiding out somewhere in the woods. And I think they knew he was in the woods. I'm sure they did. Maybe I just assumed he was in the woods, but they knew he was hiding out in North Carolina somewhere. I don't think there was ever a suspicion that he had left North Carolina. Anyway, in May of 1998, or I'm, yeah, no, in 1998, he was put on the 10 most wanted fugitives list, the 10 most wanted fugitives list, and a $1 million reward was put up for tips that led to his arrest. About six months after Rudolph went into hiding in the mountains, he sent a man named George Nordman a list of supplies that he needed. Eventually, Rudolph would come to get the supplies. He would leave Nordman $500 and steal Nordman's truck. Eric Rudolph wouldn't be seen again by anybody really for five years. He lived in Nantahala National Forest and he lived off the land. Eric Rudolph said himself that he was eating acorns and other forest animals he would kind of, you know, steal out of people's vegetable gardens and grain bins, and he would go dumpster diving around Murphy, North Carolina. But for the most part, Eric Rudolph never really left, left Nanahala Forest during that whole time. So now, now let's jump to May 31st, 2003. It was around dawn, and a police officer named Jeff Postal was patrolling around Murphy, North Carolina. This 21-year-old police officer drives around the Save-A-Lot parking lot in Murphy, and he sees a guy run, rummaging through the dumpster. Postal turns his patrol car around. Postal turns his patrol car around and confronts the man. Eventually, the officer, officer Postal, thinks he sees a gun, so he draws down on the guy and calls for backup. Now, what he actually saw was Eric Rudolph's maglite flashlight. Remember, it was dawn, and it's kind of a low-light situation. Now, of course, Eric Rudolph doesn't confess right away to being Eric Rudolph. He gives a fake name, and they take him in and tell him they're going to feed him and run his name. Unfortunately for Rudolph, he was on the 10 most wanted fugitives list, and that list was posted at the police department. So once they got him in there, they showed him the picture on the list. They showed him his own picture on the list, and they demanded that he start telling the truth. And he's quoted as saying, I'm Eric Rudolph. You got me. So Eric Rudolph officially gets captured and he's locked up for a couple years awaiting trial. 
On April 8th, 2005, not long before the trial is supposed to start, Eric Rudolph takes a plea deal. In order to avoid the death penalty, which is what most cowards would do, he agrees to confess to the Olympic bombings and three bombings and the three bombings that followed. He was sentenced to four consecutive life sentences without the chance of parole. And then they lock him up in the Supermax Federal Prison in Florence, Colorado. So like I said at the beginning, he, he finally made his trip to Colorado. He was placed in a cell block that they call Bombers Row. Other residences of Bombers Row are Ted Kaczynski, Ramsey Youssef, Terry Nichols, and Richard Reed. And like most asshole murderers, he'd write an autobiography while he's in prison. It made a total of 200 bucks. Believe it or not, I've not read it. But that, those 200 bucks in, in book sales went toward his $1 million restitution bill. And that's the end of Eric Rudolph. I would love to give you a, a long, detailed description of how he lived for five years in Nanahala Forest, but like I said, I didn't, I didn't read his shitty book, and uh, I hadn't watched a whole lot of programs on it. You're getting this episode based on purely based on my research. And I know this was a, a short episode. Sometimes I have to throw them in there. Um, I'm sorry if it was seemed rush and it was, uh, I don't know. If, I'm sorry if it wasn't a very good episode. I'm, I'm going to do better next time. But anyway, if you did like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. And it wasn't that long ago. Check the links for Facebook, the contact button, YouTube, and you can find me on most podcast players. And I know I've done a, a few crime episodes. Just to let you know, I, I think I have one or two more crime episodes, and then I'm going to get back into some some lighter North Carolina stuff. And I'm doing the listener suggestions in order. So if you've suggested something, it's going to be a little while. But since I am doing listener suggestions, uh, you know, you guys like crime. You guys like drama. And so I'm getting some suggestions for that stuff. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show, and I'll talk to you in a couple weeks.